Hello again. We're here to our new lecture in mineral processing. It's an initiative from Andifs called Destination Brazil. And today is our sixth, sixth lecture, and we're going to talk about froth flotation just a little bit because it's almost impossible. I think it's visually impossible to go deep into froth flotation in just three or four hours. But I'm going to try to tell you guys as much as I can during this time. But then again, we're just going to be scratching the surface of the flotation. And forgive me the, the game with the words, but literally we're just going to be scratching the surface of our flotation. Okay, so today it's going to be all about bubbles. That's the most important thing that we have to understand right now is flotation is complex. It's not about only one phase, just like only mineral. When we have, for example, a dry separation, it's not only about two phases when you have water and minerals, but actually we're going to talk about three phases. Okay. And some authors also point out a fourth phase, a phase and we're going to take a look at this also. But we're not going to see bubbles as beautiful as those. Okay. Actually, what we're really going to see is bubbles together with minerals and mix it with the minerals. And we're going to say that this bubble is enriched or mineralized. Okay. And that's the kind of bubble that we want to see because money is also there. Okay. But take a look at this picture. It's quite interesting to see the plateaus along the bubbles. And this is also important for us. Okay. Another thing that I want you to be careful and take a deep look into is this water right here, this water film in between two bubbles. Okay, you're gonna see a lot of those, and that's quite important for us regarding flotation. Okay, we're gonna see what's going to happen in this interface right over here. Okay, so let's move forward a little bit, and that's the kind of flotation or bubbles that I'm talking about. This is phosphate rock here in Catalan being flotated and as you can see you can definitely see the bubble itself but it's going to be a brownish bubble okay and this is because our bubble is mineralized it's carrying the minerals that in this case that we want to have it okay and you can see big bubbles over here you can see small bubbles around and this is quite normal in a flotation system now, are we going to understand a little bit more about what's going on over here, what's happening with the bubbles? But we have coalescence of the bubbles, which means two or more bubbles that goes together and form just a single bubble in the end of the process. So that's why you can eventually have these big bubbles popping around, okay? Literally popping around. So flotation is so important for us. And why flotation is important? Because nowadays, Almost 50% of all mineral commodities are being concentrated by flotation. So this is one of the reasons. Another one is because of the recover. It's really high and the selectivity in the process is also high. I know that I didn't mention to you yet about these numbers and these figures like recovery, mass recovery, and also enrichment. And next lecture, I'm going to show you the math behind this. OK, so I'm going to finish flotation first and then we're going to have a lecture just about exercise. And then you and I are going to understand a little bit more about these numbers and how they came together. So it's important for us because all of all of these reasons. OK, and one thing that we have to also take into consideration is when we talk about flotation, it's going to exploit a different property than we have in the lecture before. Okay. So if you were thinking optical, that's not the case today. It's on the last lecture. If you think about also magnetical electrostatical properties, we will also cover this. And also we covered gravitic separation. So what is happening right now for us, what is left in for us right now is physical, chemical, properties regarding the mineral surface okay so this video is actually quite good i strongly recommend you to take a look later on on youtube channel of those guys they are only focused on mineral processing the videos are not new you're going to see about the quality of the video but nevertheless 
it definitely can give you a very good insight about flotation systems. So let's take a, a quick look at this video. Particle surfaces can be either hydrophilic, water-loving, or hydrophobic, water-fearing. In this simple experiment, a water drop is placed onto the surface of a chalcopyrite particle. The water drop spreads out or wets the surface. This is an example of a hydrophilic or water-loving surface. When a water drop is placed on graphite, something completely different occurs. The drop stays beaded on the surface and does not want to spread out. This is an example of a hydrophobic or water-fearing surface. Earlier, we saw what happened when a water drop was placed onto hydrophobic and hydrophilic surfaces. This time, underwater, a small bubble produced from a syringe is placed in contact with a hydrophilic surface like chalcopyrite. As you can see, it will not attach. The same size bubble placed onto a known hydrophobic surface like graphite will attach quite readily. As we have seen, water drops do not bead on the surface of chalcopyrite because it is naturally hydrophilic. The reagents used to change a hydrophilic surface to a hydrophobic one are called collectors. This change is accomplished by collector accumulating at the mineral water interface, a process called adsorption. After the collector xanthate is applied to the mineral surface and given time to adsorb, the same experiment is repeated. Now, the water drops readily bead on the surface. The collector has accumulated on the particle surface and made it hydrophobic. So if I put an air bubble in the chalcopyrite surface, what's gonna happen? Nothing, it's going to repel the air. But if I'm trying to do this on, cal on graphite, what's gonna happen is, it's the opposite, okay? You, you can see the air attaching, naturally attaching to the graphite. Why? Because graphite has a strong effect with the air and not with the water. So it prefers to bond with the air instead of the water, okay? So now let's add collector, okay? And then we're gonna change the surface of the mineral. That's one of the most important things that we're gonna do. So after adding the collector, in this case, xanthates, and wait a little bit to have the adsorption of the collector on the surface of the mineral, that's what's gonna happen, okay? As you can see, now we have beads. So we could change the surface of the mineral and the surface properties, physical chemical properties of this mineral. And it's quite interesting, right? So instead of having now that flat surface with water, I have those beads. Very well formed and very beautiful beads being formed on the surface of chalcopyrite, okay? So yeah, keep that in mind. One of the chemicals that I have to consider are collectors, okay? And they can do this magic. So let's move on a little bit and take a look at what's happening in those minerals, those two minerals, okay? So when I have a particle and this particle is hydrophilic, and guys, the majority of our minerals are all hydrophilics, okay? So just in a few cases, very, very few cases, I have minerals naturally hydrophobic. So first thing to allow flotations to happen is change the surface of the mineral from hydrophobic into hydrophilic. But I have to do this selective, selective, okay? I can't just change all minerals at once. If I do this, I eventually going to float it everything that I have in hand. And that's not the point, okay? I just want to float it one mineral, for example, or one mineral family. So this theta over here, it's called contact angle. And you can see that we take an horizontal line over here, and then we have take this tangent over here, and this is the contact angle. So if the contact angle is something between 10 up to 90 degrees, what I'm gonna say is the material is hydrophilic, okay? So if my contact angle is above 90 until or up to 150 degrees, then I'm gonna have a picture like this, my material is or became hydrophobic. So changing from philic to phobic 
is the best thing that I can do in order to allow the flotation to happen. Okay, and those are the figure figures. They're quite difficult to happen. That's called it super hydrophilic and super hydrophobic effects. Eventually, we can even reach those. Okay, but that's not necessary in order to have flotation. I don't need to get there. Okay, but I need to have high contact angle in order to allow my material to get attached to the bubbles. And that's the trick. Okay, so I need to remove my materials, my minerals from the water and into the froth. That's the name, froth flotation. And by doing this, I need air. Of course, I need water and mineral particles, but I need something to bond the minerals with the air bubbles. And this thing, it's called collector. Okay. So as I mentioned to you before, it is a complex system. It's multi-variables. When normally we perform a design of experiments to flotation, we end up having a lot of factors in our hands. And normally they all go together into the interactions in the model. And yeah, we still have a long way to better understand the flotation and the flotation systems. And flotation itself is nothing new. It's over 100 years old. But nevertheless, we're still learning Every day we're learning new things about flotation and we're increasing our knowledge on this process because it's not easy, okay? So this picture, it's actually not real. This is not real flotation. This picture was actually ordered by some friends on Helmholtz Institute, Freiberg, Martin Rudolf ordered this picture. So this is just a representation. It's a beautiful representation of flotation. You can see the minerals on the lower part of the bubble and the bubble is it's a sphere, it's a perfect sphere and going up in the water. So that's nothing actually real, but this picture, it's real. Okay. This is a, actually an old picture. It's been around for, I think, two decades or something like that. And you can see actually flotation happening. It was one of the first pictures, good quality pictures that people took and could show, okay, these are the mineral particles and these are the bubbles and you can see the mineral particles attached to the bubbles, okay? And eventually you can see one or more mineral particles promoting something like a bridge between air bubbles, okay? So it's going to be like a linking between bubbles, as you can see, for example, in here and also in here. So that's actually something that can happen, okay? You can promote the creation of an, some sort of aggregation of materials and one mineral particle can actually be in multiple bubbles. Okay, that's not a problem at all. So thinking, taking all of this into consideration, we can prepare this chart. This is coming also from the paper and I think it's quite clever representation. And they try to summarize what we have in hands when you talk about froth flotation. So one phase that we have, and this is quite clear, is the liquid phase, okay? And here you can call this pulp. Okay, let me write down over here. So pulp, also slurry. Both terms, both words are equally correct. Okay, you can say pulp or slurry, but that's one phase. Okay, the second phase that I have, it's air. Without air, no flotation, but consider this. I don't need only air. I can use CO2, for example. I can use even nitrogen and I still can have flotation, but I need this gas phase okay so normally we use atmospheric air regular air as being this gas phase but this doesn't have to be air okay third phase that i have is the solid phase of course if i don't have solid phase why i should be doing flotation well i can perform flotation in order to separate liquid phases okay I, we can remove oil from water through flotation i can even treat sewage using flotation. So flotation is not only applied to mineral phases or solid phases, because you can also separate some materials from the recycling using flotation. But nevertheless, one thing that you must have regarding mineral processing is a solid phase. And then again, we're going to have another phase. That's the fourth phase that I mentioned to you before, and that's the regions phase. And we're not talking only about collectors. Actually, we can talk about collectors, depressants, and also modificators. Okay, the modificators we're going to see 
in the future. But we're going to come back to them and they are quite clever and quite interesting to use in our flotation system. So stay tuned. We're going to come back to that. OK, so when we talk about liquid phase, what are the main features that I have to consider regarding the liquid? Definitely the density, the solid content, because solid content, it's instantly correlated with the pulp density, but also viscosity. OK, I have to consider the my pulp viscosity. And on the other hand, if I take a look not only about the liquid phase, but also the retention time, the pulp level inside of my equipment, it could be considered as another thing that I have to take care of. OK, is this another phase? No, it's not. But it's also operational parameters. And we're going to come back to those eventually. OK, so regarding airflow rate and froth properties, then we have a lot of other properties, just like number and size of the bubbles. And this is quite important. Also, the froth stability, we're going to take a look in this in the future, even with some videos. Dispersion of the solid, and that's one of the things that I also come back to the regions or reagents. It's about dispersants and also about the density of the bubbles, the particle size distribution, the shape, and so on and so on and so on. Okay. And we also going to take care of the tension regarding my bubble. Okay. I'm going to take a look on this liquid gas interface and the surface tension of the bubble. And I can actually tune a little bit of the surface the surface tension. I'm sorry. So regarding the solid particle uh, solid face and solid particles, then again, we have another many parameters that we can actually take care of or at least look into, for example, the size, the shape, when I mean size, I mean particle size distribution. OK, the liberation of the material, the, the interesting material. If my material is or not soluble or semi soluble, it's quite important to us. Sphericity, particle volume, surface area, so on, so on, and so on. OK, yeah, guys, flotation is the best. It's really, really interesting, but it's also complicated. It's a lot of complication regarding flotation. And that's why normally when we're talking about undergraduation, we have two semesters about flotation, two semesters. The first one would be more chemical approach to flotation. Normally we call this physical chemical phenomenon. And after the second semester, we go into flotation itself. But nevertheless, I'm going to try to show you guys a little bit of flotation today. OK, so when we take a look at this picture over here, we can see flotation happening. Okay, we can see mineral particles and attached to these mineral particles, we're going to see what the collectors. Okay, so the collector is going to be adsorbed on the surface of my minerals and selectively absorbed on this minerals surface. And after that, I'm going to have this collision between the mineral particle and the bubble. And if I get lucky, they're going to attach. Okay, so that's why you can see on this part of the picture over here, the mineral that I want to is going to be attached to the bubble. Okay, and this other mineral particle over here, as you can see, hydrophilic and this one hydrophobic, it's not going to coll be collected by the bubble anymore. Why? Why do I have those black dots around this? Because that's another reagent. Okay, so if I have the yellowish ones, that I call it collectors and collector must be this bridge, this bond between the mineral particles and the bubbles, the black ones we want to expel, expel or protect the mineral surface in order to not allow any collector to absorb on that. And those are called depressants. OK, we're going to come back to those also. So in order to have flotation happenings, Normally, we have to take care or take a look into three mechanisms. The first one is the selective attachment of the air bubbles to our minerals, and that's called true flotation. Why true? Because that's the real deal. OK, so I have the mineral particle, I have the collector and I have the air bubble and they all get together and then they move up into my, inside my machine. They move up into the froth 
And after that, they're going to exit my machine, my flotation machine. So that's true flotation. That's the real flotation. Second thing that can happen is the called entrainment. Okay. I'm going to show you guys what is this, but consider this. When the bubbles are going up, they also have a drag force below, behind it. And I'm going to show you those in pictures, but that, that force, the drag force can also drag some particles with the bubble. And that's called it entrainment. Okay. Third thing is call it entrapment. And the entrapment is when I have particles being trapped between bubbles. So it's not being dragged, but it's actually being into these bubbles or around another particle, mineral particles, and the particles are trapped in there. And it's going to exit my machine, not on the way it should be. Okay, so it's going up, but it shouldn't be going up. So that's why it's not true flotation. Okay, but nevertheless, we have this. And actually, we need to measure this in order to know for sure how much material I'm losing because of the number two and number three mechanisms. So here we have another video, and this video is about what is flotation. So this is a flotation machine. Air bubbles introduced into an agitated pulp collide with particles. Here, the hydrophobic particles are shown in brown and the hydrophilic particles are shown in yellow. When the particles hit the top of the bubble, they begin to slide around it. While sliding towards the bottom of the bubble, the hydrophobic particles will become attached. At the bottom, the hydrophilic particles will fall away. Also at this point, some of the less firmly attached hydrophobic particles may detach and fall away. As the bubbles rise, they carry the attached particles to the froth, a process known as true flotation. In the end of the video, I'm gonna come back just a moment in here, just to show you like a picture. Let me move back right here. This particle over here, it went off the bubble. So the particle was actually connected to the bubble, it was attached to the bubble, and then it was released from the bubble. So what just happening in here is detachment. So that's going to happen, and that's going to happen a lot, okay? So one thing that we actually have to consider is the mechanism between mineral particles and bubble is just like fishing, exactly like fishing. So if you take your fishing rod and off you go for fishing, definitely you're going to throw the bait, and sometimes the fish is going to try to bite your bait, and you pull the bait off, and you don't have any fish. So you try it again, and eventually you're going to catch a fish, fish, right? So you can take the fish out of the water and you caught the first one. So you try it again, and then you can lose a fish. It was right there on your hook, but you lose it, okay? Many things can happen. For example, your thread can just fall apart and just break, okay? And this actually can happen in this situation our thread in here being the collector just break loose and i'm going to lose the particle but eventually the drag force is too high and i just lose the particle or i have other bubbles around it and they start to collide and they start to compress one another and i lose the particle so actually it's quite normal if you have this detachment happen even with the single particle that's going to be attached detached 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 many times and in the end, this particle is going to leave our machine, okay? But in due time. So it's going to take or could take a long time in order to help, in order to happen. So let's move forward. We have in here a sequence of three pictures that try to show you guys what's happened between the mineral surface and the air bubble. So the first thing that we have to have is the approach of the mineral surface near the bubble surface or the air surface okay and it's not the case of only put these two things together they actually have to hit each other so consider this we need energy being transferred inside of the flotation machine there is an energy gap between the water and the air and i have to break it and this energy gap it's called surface tension okay so my material has to go and go through this surface tension and then reach the air that is inside of the bubble, okay? So that's the second picture. The rupture of the bubble allowing the particle to get 
directly in touch with the air. So the third picture, it's quite good picture also, is the equilibrium. Because after a moment or a few moments, what is going to happen is my material is going to get into equilibrium with the air inside of the bubble. And that's the maximum that you can have. Okay, And that's connected, directly connected with the contact angle between the mineral and the particle. Okay, And the particle being the bubble, the air bubble. Okay, So this is one simulation, it's quite clever and quite nice simulation in just two options over here. So the first one, I have a static bubble, so it's an immobile bubble and the water is flowing around the bubble. And on the second case, the bubble is going up okay, and the water is stopped. Okay. And they're going to take a look at the velocities of these two cases. In the two cases, the bubble diameter is 0.9 millimeters, so less than one millimeter. What you can see is, if you consider the bubble is quiet, stopped, okay, and the water is flowing around the bubble, then you have a huge gap here where the velocity stands to zero. Okay? That's actually a negative pressure area. That's what I'm talking to you before about being material around the bubble, but not connected to the bubble and just being dragged by the bubble, okay? And if you take a look at this simulation over here, this area is also here. So yes, guys, when the bubble is moving, it moves a lot of water around it. And as you can see, the, the velocity profile, it's going to speed up a lot of the water. And by doing this, the fine particles are not going to be able to hit the bubble and get attached to it. Why? Because it doesn't have energy enough to do this. So one thing that we must consider right now is if I let the bubble just go up, I don't have energy enough to have the material just colliding into it. So I have to change or the geometry of my equipment or the equipment itself in order to transfer energy to the particle size, the mineral particle size, in order to collide with the air bubble and then get those two attached. Okay. And that's possible. Just have to be a little bit clever and change my equipment just a little bit. So let's talk about hydrodynamics of the bubble. Okay. So when the bubble goes up, it creates a wake around it. Okay. And also we have the streamlines that I showed you guys before on that simulation. And those streamlines can be also a way to reject my minerals because the streamlines just want to shear off my mineral particles. So the attachment between mineral particles and the air bubble has to be high enough in order to go through the streamlines and keep that particle attached to the air bubble. So it has to be stronger than just the streamlines. Okay. And also we have a probability of a particle bubble collision being so small or so less energy that nothing gonna happen. Okay. So the collision is going to be an uh, elastic collision. So the bubble is going to collide and just going to eject our mineral. That's what I'm going to show you guys in this video. As a bubble rises, it causes pulp to flow around it and a wake to form behind it. This is represented by flow stream lines. This flow will tend to deflect particles and reduce the probability of collision. The probability of collision is the number of particles that actually collide relative to the number in the path of the bubble. This probability is surprisingly small. One bubble may collide with fewer than one in a hundred of the particles in its path. As a consequence, a large number of bubbles must be produced. Larger particles are less influenced by pulp flow streamlines and are more likely to collide with a bubble. Here, Two particles of the same mineral are in the path of a rising bubble. The larger particle is not deflected as much as the small one. The result is that the large particle collides and the small one does not. The contact time is the time it takes a particle to slide around a bubble. The speed at which a particle slides depends mainly on its weight. Here, two particles of the same mineral collide with a bubble. The larger particle slides faster and doesn't have time to attach. When a hydrophobic particle collides with a bubble and slides along its surface, it begins to penetrate the water film. To attach, the particle must penetrate this layer. 
The time it takes for this to occur is called the induction time. Induction time decreases with increasing particle hydrophobicity. If the induction time is longer than the contact time, the particle will not attach. A second process, attachment, discriminates between hydrophobic particles and hydrophilic ones. Here, two particles, one hydrophilic and one hydrophobic, are in the path and collide with a rising bubble. The hydrophobic particle is able to break through the water film on the bubble and attach. The hydrophilic particle slides along the bubble until it reaches the bottom, at which point it eventually falls away. With increasing particle size, the collision probability increases and the attachment probability decreases. The combined effect is that collection probability tends to be highest at intermediate size ranges. This corresponds to a common flotation plant observation that as particle size increases, collection reaches a maximum over a certain size range and then decreases. In here we can see the water, the string lines, and how the particle goes around the bubble going up because of this string, water stream lines. Okay, so then again, it's nothing new. We already showed you guys a lot about this. But now let's take care about particle size distribution. Okay, so let's consider again a coarse, a middle, or a middle and a fine particle. So if I take a look at the coarse particles, what's going to happen is the collision probability is too high. It's definitely high, okay? But the attachment probability is not that high. So that's why the coarse particle can go through the bubble and actually it can even break the bubble. This particle could be like a projectile and go straight into the bubble and break the bubble into two, okay? This actually can happen. If I take a look at the intermediate size particle, what's going to happen is it's the optimum flotation. It's the best scenario. Why? Because the particle is going to be slightly diverged from its trajectory because of the bubble going up. But then again, the particle can hit the bubble and can hit in a way that it's going to allow the particle time enough to get attached to the bubble and to stay attached. Okay, and on the right hand side, what you can see is the fine particles, so no collision. And that's what I have to manage. Okay, two coarse particles, mineral liberation is going to be low, collision is going to be high, attachment is going to be low. Okay, when I go to fine particles, probably everything liberated, it's a dream, okay, but we don't have collision. And if we do have collision, we don't have energy enough in order to make this collision what? Significant. Okay. And then have the particle attached to the bubble. Okay. But if you go to this medium size, then everything is going to be okay. And then I can have flotation. So it is possible for us to summarize the solid phase inside of the flotation system in four different states. So the first state that I can find my particles is particles suspended in pulp phase, okay? And pulp phase, I mean liquid phase. So as you can take a look at this representation over here, so the particles are in the bulk of my solution. They are just around the solution. This is actually a really good picture because as you can see, we don't have two or more particles attached to each other. And that's why we have a dispersion of my particles. And that's really good for flotation. If all the particles are away from each other, okay? We're gonna understand this in a few moments. So the second state that I can have my particles, my mineral particles is attached to the air bubble. And that's what you can see over here. So this is beautiful. My bubble is mineralized, okay? My bubble is carrying minerals. So the bubble is doing her job. Okay, but that's only the second state that I can find. The third state that I can find is particle attached, attached to the plateau phase. And that's what I'm seeing over here. And I'm gonna show you guys in the next couple of slides, just to zoom in into the plateau borders and we're gonna see what is happening there. But they are like just pipes that the water flows through it. 
and I need to have water over there, otherwise my bubble is going to break. And the last thing that I can have, or the last state that I can have, it's particle entrained into the plateau borders. And that's just this particle over here. So looking at that particle, what I can see, the particle is not attached to any bubble. It's like a single particle floating around, okay, or flying around, let's use this expression, just make sure that nobody's going to misunderstand me, it's flying around inside of the, our liquid, but without touching anyone. But there is a, a repulsion between the gas phases and the other gas phase and the mineral in the middle. So the mineral is going to be like floating, it's not the right word, but flying around, okay? Let's consider this word. And this red line over there, it's going to show you roughly where is the interface between the pulp phase and on the top, the froth phase. Okay? And it's quite important for us to study where this interface is. So this is the first machine, flotation machine that I'm going to show you. This is actually one of the first, and this is the flotation cell, and we call this mechanical flotation cell because the energy driven into this, it's mechanical. So I have this X, this vertical X, and this X is going to do actually more than two things, but at least two things. The first one is, it's going to rotate, and on the bottom of it, on the, on the head of this X right here, I have my impeller, okay? This is also called rotor, stator, but impeller is a very good name, okay? A very good, a very used name. So once the impeller is spinning around, what's going to happen is I will be delivering energy direct to my system. So remember that I have to give energy to the system. If I don't give energy to the system, particles are not going to be able to collide with my min of my air bubbles and get attached. So by doing this, then everything is going to be spinning around but then arise my first problem i have the particles going into one direction and the air bubbles almost going in the same direction and slightly going up so the air bubble is going to go this direction and this so i have like a resultant like this but the mineral particles are just going around and if the two are moving with the same speed what is going to happen nothing okay i don't have any expressive energy being transferred to the mineral and then hit both but that's not going to happen why because i have momentum in my mineral and this momentum it's velocity plus mass okay and since we have more mass in the mineral particles that we have in the air bubble it's going to happen the collision and this collision is going to have energy enough to allow the particle to go through the surface, the liquid, the liquid air surface, and then get attached. Okay, so that's why it's quite important to understand what is the right rotation of the impeller to allow this first thing to happen. Second thing, I want to have minerals going up to the froth zone, okay, to the froth itself. But I also want the other mineral particle that I don't want to go to the froth to go down, to depress, and then to exit my machine on the bottom of it. Okay, so actually I can have two different kinds of flotations. I'm going to call, I'm going to come back to this. So this is what I, we call it direct flotation. Okay, so direct flotation is my froth is rich in the mineral that I want. Okay, so this is direct flotation. And then we have the reverse flotation. What is the reverse flotation? The froth is carrying the tailings. So I'm going to throw all the froth away. I don't want these minerals on the froth. So one good example for this is iron ore. Here in Brazil, we prefer to float it. quartz and the press hematite is more selective by doing this. And then I just throw all the froth away because froth is going to be carrying quartz and not hematite, which is my ore, okay? So in here, we have the concentrate leaving my machine, and then it's going to find like a pipeline over here, call it lounder, and I can even add water in order to break the froth and let my material flows. 
more easily through my longer. Okay, so as you can see over here, in here we have the feed. Okay, so we have to be extra careful and not to allow the particles just to bypass my feed into the froth. The particles has to go around, take a, a spin over here and then go down or go up. But then again, I had time in order to separate those particles. Okay. And here we have the slurry. So one thing that you must be considering is, and definitely I agree with you, may I put all my regions together in a flotation system? And the answer is no. Okay. Since I have to spend some time in order to have my mineral in connect directly connected or in touch with the collector and then to add the depressant, then I have to guarantee that we have time for each region to take place and to happen, to make their magic. And then I took this pulp after the conditioning and feed the flotation equipment. Okay. So if you try to add all your chemicals together inside the flotation machine, you're not going to be able to flotate at all. Okay. At all. So first stage, I add depressant. Second stage, I add collector. Third stage, I act frother, okay, and then I have flotation. For example, if I have an activator, that's going to be another stage, and it's going to be before the adding of the collector. But I'm going to show you guys this later on, okay? So as you can see, then we have one feed over here, one tailings coming out in here, and one concentrate stream come out of here, okay? So in a steady state, everything that is go that goes in has to go out and that's why concentrate plus tailings should be the same amount of material as the feed okay so in theory that's what's gonna happen so this is also a picture from here from catalan and as you can see the cell was under maintenance so they took remove everything from the side of the cell and you can see the rotor down there so the rotor first thing that it has to do is to give energy to the system second thing is to make particles go up again. So if I'm losing some of my interesting material, I just let this material goes up in touch with the air bubbles and then we have true flotation. And the third thing that the impeller has to do is normally the rotation of the impeller itself is enough to promote a depressing, the, uh, low pressure area. And by doing this, I can suck air into the flotation cell just by rotating the impeller. And that's why you can see over here the airflow and doesn't have to be connected with the compressor or something like that. The cell can actually drag the air inside of it by itself. Okay, so if you'd like, you can also connect the compressor and have more control of your process or at least pump air into your process. But if you don't want to do this, actually it's not compulsory. Okay, you can go by without it. So that's a different machine though. Okay, that's a column flotation. And what's gonna happen here is the hydrodynamics is completely different. So the poop is fed three quarters from the total height from the, the, top, uh, the top part, the upper part of my column flotation. And we don't have agitation. We don't have agitation at all. So the particles start to go down, just to drop down. And then you're going to ask me, but you mentioned that we need to have energy. So where this energy is coming from? From potential energy being converted into kinetic energy. So the, for the column flotation, it's really high. Okay. So the height is way bigger than the diameter. So that's why you're going to have a long time of the particles going down, just free settling, and then they're going to increase the speed and ultimately they're going to reach terminal velocity. And when this happens, the bubbles are going to go up and they're going to get attached. So if in the first case, the particles are going in one direction and the bubbles are going the same direction, so everything is spinning in the same way, in the same direction, I'm going to lose okay, energy in the process because of this. 
in the column flotation, I don't have to worry about this because it's counter current. The air is going up and the particle size going down and they're going to collide. So that simulation that I showed to you before exactly applicated or directly applicated to this kind of flotation system. Okay, so consider this and we're gonna move forward. So in here you can see two lab machines on your left hand side, we have a mechanical cell and on the right hand side, we have a column flotation cell, okay? So they're completely different. You can just take a look at how high is the column. So it's standard to have columns with three or even four meters high and the diameters of something like 10 centimeters or 20 centimeters. When you take a look at the flotation cell on the left hand side, it's going to be something like one liter or even less volume of my poop. And another thing that we also need to consider, if you take a look at the mechanical cell for lab scale application, it's a bad process. Okay, so it's not continuous process. But on the other hand, the column flotation, it's continuous. So it's really good to do this kind of uh, tests on it. So let us take a look a little bit about bubble generation. How can we actually produce burbujas? In mechanical flotation cells, the air is introduced into the blades of a rotating impeller. The air accumulates behind the blade and is therefore traveling at a high speed relative to the slurry. The relative motion of air and slurry causes shear at the boundary and the air is broken up into tiny bubbles. The speed of the impeller will affect the size of the bubbles produced. Column cells, apart from their different physical appearance, are distinguished from mechanical cells by their bubble generation system. In this laboratory column cell, the bubble generation can be seen clearly through the transparent shell. Columns are not mechanically agitated and air bubbles are introduced by using spargers. A sparger is a device for introducing a stream of gas in the form of small bubbles into a liquid, in this case by injecting air through very small holes into the pulp. The size of the bubbles is controlled by the size of the holes. So if you have an aquarium on your house, probably you have something like this in order to promote the bubbles to form. Okay. So then again, we can control the size of the bubbles. We can control even the shape of the bubbles. The air hold up is what is a cross section of my column flotation. And I take a look on how much water I have, how much gas I have, and how much mineral particles I have into the same instant of time. Okay. So the hold up, or the air hold up is the amount of air that I have in those sections. So this is also a very clever graphic and it's trying to show you what me, where mechanical cells is good and where column cells are good okay so mechanical cells they are great if you're talking about coarse particles and those machines they are really good because they have high recovery i can take back almost all of my desired minerals so when you go into columns they are very nice if you consider fine part. So 150 is definitely something that we can draw a line in order to separate mechanical cells from column. And actually, the, according to the mineral, this number is not fixed. For example, we perform flotation in here with 100 micrometers and that's okay. 800 micrometers, it's okay. But if you try to do this with less than 20 micrometers, then it's not going to work, okay? But you can try to use this in a column flotation. And actually, guys, we have more equipment than not only mechanical cells and column flotation. We have FAD, which is uh, dissolved air flotation in English. FAD is in Portuguese. So in English, we call this dissolved air flotation or DAF and we can even treat sewage with DAF, okay? So there are other machines, other laws that you have also to consider when you talk about flotation. So in here, we have another video and this video is quite nice because it's going to show you hydraulic in training. So guys, take a look at this poop. And if you consider what kind of soup do we have over there, is yes, we have a soup and we have an iron ore soup, okay? So we have 
iron ore and that's probably going to be hematite plus quartz and then we're going to start the impeller we're going to start the bubbles but consider this okay we're not gonna let the material go out of the cell i just want to take a look what's going to happen if the flotation wheel system was actually good and efficient probably i should be able to see my froth all in white okay because no material without interaction between the collector and the bubble should be reaching the, the froth zone but that's not the case Okay, so let's take a look and see what's actually going to happen when we turn on the impeller and turn on the air bubbles, okay? Not all particles enter the froth by the collection process. Some of the very fine particles are entrained with the water carried by bubbles. A clear example of this can be seen when hematite is placed in a laboratory flotation cell. Once the air is turned on, many fine hematite particles report to the froth, giving it a reddish color. This cannot be the result of the collection process as hematite is hydrophilic and will not attach to bubbles. A little wash water proves this point. The wash water simply replaces the water in the bubble film and between the bubbles and thereby washes the entrained particles back into the pulp. In this case, we have to put a little bit of frother. So guys, in here we have various, actually five ways of having ultra fine particles not collected okay and they are just go in trained into flotation so the first thing that i have on letter a is carrying upward in the plateau regions okay so we have the plateaus and we're gonna have a zone in the middle of the plateaus that the water is going to be trapped in there and if the water is trapped in there probably can have particles also trapped in there and all the particles are going up and the particles just follow the flow okay and go up together with them so the second thing is entrapment. So take a look, we have the black particles and the black particles means mineral particles that I want, okay? And the white ones are the particles that I don't want it. I want to get rid of those. And it's going to be quite common to see black and white because we have for this coal and pyrite, but we also have iron ore and, emat and quartz. So emetite is going to be the black one or magnetite and the white one is going to be quartz, okay? So entrapment is what I have many particles. They can be together, creating an agglomerate or not. But the particles that are inside of this, in, but in the water, they can move. They can find a way just to get rid of that and get released. So that's why we have entrapment. So in order to remove this particle over there, I have to separate the air bubbles. And that's why I add washing water. Okay, and that's extra water can do the trick. Okay, so let us see what it's saying, it's seeing over here is supporting. And supporting is quite a nice idea. So consider this right now, we have an air lift. So the air is coming from below and it's going up. And by doing this, it's gonna find some particles going down. It's not going to allow the particles to go through or even to get attached because it's not, my ore is not the particles under my interest they are tailings but then again i'm pushing everything up and everyone up and eventually i support these particles up and they end up going out of my machine and into my concentrate okay nevertheless it is what it is and least but not important oh sorry we have the slime coating i'm gonna come back to this in just a second and we have waking okay so this waking is what the depression area that i have below the bubble behind the bubble the bubble goes up the particles go right after it just like a comet and you take a look at the tail of the comet it's been almost the same okay you have a chunk of rock and this chunk of rock it's moving okay and after it we have small particles being dragged by the comet call it comet tail it's the same in here okay so what is slime coating i just mentioned too fast sometimes you can have a coarse particle and it's going to be completely surrounded by fine particles okay and those fine particles together attach it to the surface of the coarse particles are called slime because they are too fine so we call those particles slime coating 
they are just like being painted over there okay and i have to find a way to remove those particles otherwise i'm going to ruin completely i'm going to screw up my flotation okay so i'm going to show you guys how to disperse this so i mentioned to you before that we're going to show you a picture a slide about the plateaus and how the material goes inside of the plateau so this is it okay in blue you can see water and white you can see the air and the surface formed between blue and white is exactly that surface that we're going to have that interface that we're going to have between water on, on, the, on one hand and air on another hand okay so the waste material or the tailings are the white particles the blue particles are the value particles and the mixed particles are exactly this the middlings particles that have part of one material and part of the other so as you can see the particles have a very strange way to be around in the system so it can be entrapment just take a look at this trap over here this part is connected in here this other one it's collected in here and this one it's around but it's not allowing this one to move away so the particle is literally trapped pinned in that position okay nothing that i can do nothing at least so far okay this is the attachment that i want this is the real flotation the true flotation okay so in this case over here i have a locked particle which one is the locked one this one okay so i have part of my particle being of composed by waste and another part composed by the mineral that i want and i can't separate those it's literally impossible okay because i just received this material from the mill and the mill couldn't break so they're going to be attached and i'm going to have or this material going to the concentrate to the froth all sinking down or depressing down and exiting my machine with the tailings there is no other option okay so we can hear and see entrainment so everything is going up and the particles just follow the flow and that's entrainment so we can see then attachment entrapment entrainment and locked particles yeah well, we're advancing we're advancing a lot okay and we're increasing our knowledge on flotation that's amazing just me let me cool down a little bit my my focal cords so guys let us move to the first chemical that i have that we have and those chemicals are called collectors okay it's not just one and actually a family of collectors or families of families of collectors i'm gonna try to show you but normally we have this material resembling this picture that I'm showing you, okay? So we have a functional group that we call head of the collector. Then we have the hydrocarbon chain and we need to have a big carbon chain like C18 up to C22 in order to put my mineral away from the, part, the air bubble but not too away okay so what's going to happen is the functional group is going to attach is going to absorb or being absorbed by the mineral surface and on the other hand we're going to have the tail of my collector going through the interface liquid gas and into the gas and being stuck it over there being held over there and then we have true flotation and that's why we have this kind of representation of a, a collector okay so hydrophobicity is most important for us and has to be impaired in most of the minerals and the surfactant that i add to the process in order to have this i call collector okay so it is a surfactant and it is quite important guys if we want to understand this we have to understand double layer we have to understand Lena Jones potential and potential pits and then we have to understand a little bit more of physics and physical chemical process in order to allow us to correct understand what is happening but so far let's consider this okay I have a mineral and I have to break this mineral and by doing this I'm going to break bonds okay so the surface of the mineral it's going to be charged eventually I can make this charge behave like no charge like zero charge 
but to most cases I have my material charged okay it's charged so in my solution I don't have only water I have other electrolytes and those electrolytes start to move to migrate to be close to my mineral parts and that's why I have something called double electric layer okay and this electrical double layer means what this that you can see over here the solid is negative and then the I, the positive ions in my bulk solution is going to start to migrate to get near to the mineral particle and then because of this the negative ions just go through because there is a lot of positives going there I'm a negative I'm going to be there too okay so that's what's gonna happen and then we have the mineral surface and we have this plane that we call this sleeping plane and this this sleeping plane over here and the collector they're gonna have this behavior right here okay i have the positive going into the surface of the mineral in this case negative and then we have the tail of the collector just laying around so if you consider this we can divide our collectors in groups or families we have the non-ionizing group and then we have the ionizing group and if you take different books different papers you're gonna see different groups every time we see a different group a different classification and so on okay so this is nothing that it's written in stone and then we have anionic and we have cationic collectors and for example the anionic can be subdivided in oxydryl group and sulfidryl group and the oxyhydryl group is the carbohydroxylic the sulfates the sulfonates and on the sulfidryl group we have the xanthates and the thiophosphates and then you can see the chemical formula below but then again guys the real picture of this it's way bigger than what i'm showing to you it's just some examples but i do prefer this kind of division of collect so we have anionic cationic a mix of different collectors and we have bio that's quite nice now the word bio appears for the first time because we do have bio flotation and i'm going to come back to this in a few minutes okay and then we have ionic liquids okay, so those are also possible to have as group or groupments for collectors and if you take a look at the first one okay there is no bio in here so there is no space for bio flotation and now we use microorganisms like bacteria as collectors okay but by doing this we have bio flotation so guys take a look at this other picture and it's quite similar to what was proposed by Bulatovich in 2007 we have this polar head or well, functional group of my collector and then we have the non-polar tail okay so if I put this into book solution what's going to happen is my collectors are going to start to act like a surface tension agent so it's going to attach not only to the mineral particle but also to the air bubble and that's what's going to happen that definitely going to happen okay and then if i take a look at the surface tension of the air bubble what i'm going to see is, is a decrease on the surface tension why because i'm going to have right here my collectors is starting to go into that interface and by doing this it's going to reduce the surface tension if i allow this continue to happen and by allow i mean if i continue to increase the collector concentration what's gonna happen is i'm gonna achieve this point call it cmc and could be be understand as the critical concentration of my collector and after that point i start to promote some micellar or uh, micelles being formed so this is the micellar concentration okay so critical micellar concentration is that point after that i'm gonna have a reaction between collector and collector so you don't want to have this okay because you're just throwing away your collector you can take a look at this we have a collector over here and the group function it's all outside so if this guy just see one part mineral particle it's going to attach to it and it's going to be a hard attachment 
because you're gonna have like more than one head of my micelle being attached to the surface. And then we're gonna have another one, another one, and so on. And what's gonna happen is there is no collector having the non-polar tail out in order to have the collection being happening. Okay, so the attachment is not gonna happen. And in the end, my particle, my mineral particle is going to depress. Okay, and I'm losing my collector because I'm just throwing away all my collector, and of course I'm throwing away away my mineral particles because I just can't make this happen. Okay, so guys, stay below the CMC. Okay, don't go after the CMC. And we have equipment on our lab in order to actually measure the CMC. Why? As you can see, the surface tension tends to be a plateau, then it starts to drop, and then became a plateau again. So what we do is we measure the surface tension, we start to add collectors, and we start to add collector and keep adding, and then we're going to see this drop. And when it stabilizes again, I know for sure that I reach the CMC. Okay, so we know the maximum concentration of collector that we can use. And guys, I want to show you a different family of collectors called fatty acids. And those guys are quite nice when you try to float it phosphate rock, appetite, but also you can float it iron ore if you, you want. It's not what we use here in Brazil, but if you want, you can also have this flotation of iron ore with fatty acids, but you can also float it calcite. So if you have calcium in your chemical formula, you can consider to use fatty acids because it's going to attach to calcium sites, okay? And then in our lab, we were considering, well, how can we get fatty acids but without using synthetic ones? And one thing that we had in mind was green flotation because we love green chemistry. And then we start to take a look on plants on the Brazilian savanna that has high oil potential and that we could extract oil for those. And the first one that we found, uh, oh, sorry. And the second one that we found was this one. Okay, this one is Macauba. I showed this guy as the first one because the best results that we got so far is for this plant, Macauba. And as you can see, we have this coconut, it's small coconuts, okay. And like in here, you can take a better look at the size of the coconuts. And in Brazil, we have just artisanal production of macaoba. We don't have industrial agriculture of macaoba. And this is changing. Okay, I think this year we're going to have the first harvest of macaoba for industrial production of oil and biomass. And we can actually produce oil from two different parts of macaoba. As you can see in this picture, we have this yellow part called epicarp or bark, okay? And this is the crust of the fruit, okay? It's something like 21% in mass of the, of the, in weight of the, the fruit. And we can have applications for this. We can extract the fibers and use these fibers together with polymers. We can also make some briquettes of this material in order to, to burn those. So, if you want to have some thermal energy, you can just burn this and it's not rich in oil, okay? But the oil in the bark can also help it to better uh, burn, okay? And then we have the mesocarp, it's called poop. And this is, that is this yellow part over here. And it's quite tasty, okay? So you can actually eat it and it's 38% and has a lot, a lot of oil potential. And that's the oil that we are using. Then you have the endocarp, which is this black part over here and looks like coal, okay? but it's quite hard. It's quite sturdy, it's difficult to break. But if you break it, you can again, use this to other stuff, even to burn it. And then you have a nut inside. Actually you have two nuts and it's this one, this white part over here called this endosperm. And it's only 7%, but you can also extract fatty acids from, the, from that part. And people use this as moisturizer for hair and also for your skin. So pharmaceuticals use that are going to be addressing only endosperm. And that's great because the mesocarp is going to be fully available to us. And then we extract oil. 
okay? Another plant that we took a look on that, it's not actually a natural uh, Brazilian plant. It was introduced in Brazil. And what is quite nice of the Jartrofa curcas is it doesn't demand a lot of water to survive or even to produce. So you can have huge areas on the Brazilian savanna or in worst case, in the northeast part of the Brazil, where you don't have a lot of water or water availability, and Jatrupa, Jatrofa curcas can survive and can produce. Okay, so now we're taking a look at the seeds. We just crash the seeds and you can remove. You can actually do this by cold oil remove and you can produce oil from the seed. Jatrofa curcas was introduced in Brazil because of the biodiesel production. So it was like a huge promise plant Jatrofa curcas because it's a purine species and we're going to buy all of your production. We're going to produce biodiesel from this. But it never took off. Okay, so now we have fields of Jatrofa curcas in Brazil without application. And what is bad about Jatrofas is there's nothing you can do with this. Nowadays, there is no application for Jatrofa curcas. And we can give one application, we can extract oil, okay? So we have a patent for, patent for deposited for Macauba oil. We have another patent for Jatrofa curcas. We can have plenty of papers. Just feel free to browse those and you can see what these beauties can offer you. But that's the fatty acid profile of these two plants, okay? The fruit and the seed. And as you can see over here, we have four jatrofas, 40% of linoleic acid. And it's quite good linoleic acid. Why? Because for flotation, C18, it's really good, okay? Some authors point out that oleic acid is the best fatty acid for flotation. That's not entirely true. If you try to perform flotation with only oleic acid, that's not going to work. I have a theory about this. I can come back later on and explain to you guys, but actually you need a mix of fatty acids. That's for sure. Okay. Don't try to use a single fatty acid because that's not going to work. And so far, what we're doing is we took this mixtures of fatty acids, just go straight to flotation and see what happens. And that's not the way to do it. Definitely, we need to input some simulations into the process in order to allow us to save money and time. Okay, but definitely what we're doing is just try it and see what's going to come out of that. So again, when you take a look at the Macauba, the profile is a little bit different. We have oleic acid, but again, is is another C18. There is a difference because we have a different branch on one in your lake and the, another one we have two branches in the Lino Lake and the position is nine in one and six and nine in the other one, but both fatty acids are considered quite good for flotation. And then we have a short or a little bit shorter length uh, on my link, on my tail, which is C16, is a palmitic acid, okay? And it's almost the same concentration in both materials. So Macauba and Jatropha. And the result is we can float uh, uh, phosphate rock, apatite, calcite and so on using this oil and the preparation is the same is the standard we just add sodium hydroxide and we call this saponification of our collector and just use this because in the end collectors are only soap okay we're adding soap to our system and this soap can float the minerals so this is another plant it's well appreciated this plant in, in this area that I'm living in Catalan and also in other areas of Brazil. And there is something quite interesting in this plant. For many centuries, you couldn't just plant it. So if you took like a small piece of it, or if you took the seed and if you try to plant the tree, it doesn't grow. Okay. So there is this kind of legend that the piqui plant have to grow by itself. And during a long time, it was actually true. But now recently people could understand the secret of Piqui and now you can also plant this tree. And this is great because now we can have more fruits available. And that's the flower of Piqui or Piqui's flower. 
And I know this is quite exotic flower and it's quite beautiful also. And we we'll take a look at this. Looks like a passion fruit flower, but it's slightly different. But one thing that draw your attention is the size of the flower. So it's not a small flower. It's like a full hand flower. Okay, so it's quite big flower and it's very, very beautiful. And this is the Piki. Again, you can extract the oil from the outer part, this white part, oh, it, mm, light yellowish part, but the dark yellow part or the orange part is the best part we can extract the oil. It's high uh, concentration of oil in this part and it's very typical to many, many parts of the Brazil, so it's nothing new. Okay, you just go there and you take the picky and you can extract the oil. Uh, one thing that you have to consider is there are thorns inside of the picky. So many people just love picky. Uh, it's something that you can actually dish. This is like a picky risotto. So it's rice and picky. And this yellow color in the rice, it's coming from picky. So the flavor, it's very, very unique. And also the, the smell is unique. But when you try to bite it, you have to consider there, is, there are thorns inside of the piki. Okay, so you have to know how to eat it. Otherwise, you're going to end up in the hospital with a lot of thorns in your tongue. And trust me, I never been there before. Okay, I never been in this situation, but I, I saw people in the situation. It's not okay because your tongue is going to swallow and you're going to be end up without talking for like two or three days. Okay. So this is the piki oil extracted in our own lab okay. and it's very beautiful it's regular oil but then again it floats okay you can go with this to flotation and then as i mentioned to you before we try to take a look also on bio flotation but different than many works that had been done in bio flotation we decided to have a different approach okay so regular bio flotation is we took like a biomass and we just activate this biomass and use it, okay? We didn't try to do this. We took a look at what kind of biomass we could use that would be cheap, especially if it was like a car product or a byproduct or even a tailing, okay? A waste material that actually contains fatty acid. And then my postdoc student, Diego, he came to me and said, he, he is a biologist, by the way. He came to me and said, okay, we have Saccharomyces cerevisiae uh, or cerevisiae and these naughty guys, they, they are quite clever and they are, they are available everywhere. And so I told him, okay, but what kind of material is this? It's yeast, it's baker yeast. Said, well, yeast, it's quite good because nobody has allergy to yeast. The yeast is everywhere, it's part of the human culture for millenniums. So, yeah, it would be very nice to work with yeast. It's completely safe. I said, yeah, it's completely safe. So we took a look at this. There's a microscope photo. And then one thing that also draw, drew our attention is how fast yeast can reproduce and replicate. So it's amazing. They double their population every 100 minutes. Okay? And they can subdivide 26 times before die it's it's literally incredible okay so the production is really high it's higher than what we can actually use in our minds and then what we did was we just took the material and tried to float it and we couldn't okay it doesn't float it's not a collector then after like a few weeks of trial i came to diego and said okay diego you told me that they have lipids so do like this attack our material, attack our Saccharomyces cerevis with sodium hydroxide. And let's see what's going to come out of that. Okay. And he looks like a little bit disbelieved and said, okay, if you want me to try it, I can try it. And something surprisingly happened. It worked. So if you actually go straight to saponification and after that to flotation, you can actually use this bio collector. On the other hand, that, that's the, the good hand on the bad side, okay, you need a lot of cells in order to have the flotation. So the, the dosage of the cells are quite high. So nowadays we're studying why, 
and we're trying to increase the process and even to decrease the amount of sodium hydroxide that we need in the process. Okay, so we're still working on this. It's an ongoing work. And every time that I actually talk about this with people, they ask me the same question. But saccharomyces cerevis, they produce froth because when you're using fatty acids, you don't need another chemical in order to produce your froth because fatty acids plus sodium hydroxide equals soap. So you actually made a liquid soap. Okay? It's straightforward, it's plain and simple. You have soap in your hand. And that's the result that we had after we add water into this micro flotation tube or also call it Helimon tube. Okay, and you can see on the top of it, this white part over here, that's our froth. Okay, so we don't, we didn't have any minerals in the system yet. We just made this picture just to show in conference and Congress, just to show the guys, yes, if you took this, this material, this BYC, that's why Baker East cell, and you saponify those and add to water, you can definitely, you can have froth, okay? You don't need a froth. And if you add minerals to your system, and if you perform the flotation, that's what you're going to end up having. So this white, oh, sorry, this blue part, because over here, that's all appetite, okay? The appetite particles that we're using during this test are igneous appetite. They are quite blue appetite. So you can see the particles on the top of it. So yes, we could float it over 95% of all appetite crystals. So it's quite good. So we're not only doing green flotation, we're doing also bio flotation. And so to say bio green flotation, it's even better, right? Yeah, bio green flotation, it's great. So guys, we have to talk about operating var variables or variables when we talk about flotation, and then we can have this triangle where we have equipment components, operation components, and then chemistry components. Okay. So when you take a look at the chemistry components, what do we have? Collectors, frotters, activators, depressant, and pH regulators. Okay. So in here, I just put pH, but pH regulators. If I take a look at the equipment components or equipment design, what I have is the cell design, okay? And that's quite important, especially the volume of the cell. Plus the agitation system, let's try to translate this a little bit better. The energy deliver system, okay? How can I actually deliver system to, uh, sorry, deliver energy to my flotation system, okay? and how my particles and my air bubble are going to absorb this energy and how they are going to be interact, how they are going to behave, okay? Airflow, cell blank configuration, cell bank configuration, I'm gonna come back to this in the end of this lecture, but I'm gonna show you that we don't perform just one flotation. I actually have a bank of cells. I'm gonna do many flotation and then cell bank control. How can I control this? There's all the variables inside of this bank, okay? And on the operation thing, components, I have feed rate. That's quite important because if I add more material, my throughput is going to be what? Part concentrate, part failings. So if you add even more and more material, it's going to end up producing it more and more. But what are you producing? Okay, maybe you're just producing garbage. That's why you have to take a look at this. Mineralogy, particle size distribution, pulp density and temperature, okay? Temperature is a key component to flotation, but it's, neg it's neglected, okay? So in a few, few cases, people actually do flotation, taking care and highly consideration the temperature, especially for rare earth elements. So in China, they do hot flotation and then they took care of the temperature. But then again, people just neglect that. Other thing that you should be taking a look at is the altitude that you make in your flotation. Because if you try to float at 5,000 meters high, it's just impossible. The, the bubbles are not going to be 
ready for flotation. There's not going to be good bubbles. So that's why you have to take care also about the pressure in the place that you want floating. Okay. So this is another shot coming from another auto, and he's going to put pretty much the same things, but in a different way. Okay. So they're going to put like inputs, and then we have material inputs and also energy input. Okay. And if you take a look in here, you can see heat as one input because we have hot flotation. Okay. If you take a look at the operating vari variables, there are others, other vari variables that wasn't before, just like impeller speed. Impeller speed is right here. Okay. The clearance of the flotation is here. How good is your control? If it's automatic or not. And even there are some variables that are stochastic. Okay. So you do have like a lucky component in flotation. I'm sorry, but it is what it is. Okay. Then you have the machine design and dimensions, and then you have your outputs and you have material output. You have energy output because definitely the energy is going to be transformed and you're going to have sound vibration and so on. So yes, you can actually perform this balance. Okay. But in here, I brought to you 11 points. Okay. See how difficult flotation can be. 11 points that's going to be known as most important in flotation as variables. Okay. So let's try to summarize this. So first, slurry properties. So everything that you can imagine regarding slurry hydrodynamics, it's quite interesting to take a look. Okay. So rheology of your slurry, take into consideration. Density, solid content, viscosity, anything. Okay. Slurry flow rate. Okay, because flow rate is going to be directly connected with what? Retention time or residence time. So if you have a high flow rate, your material is not going to be allowed to stay in the equipment as much as it needs. So probably you're going to end up losing a lot of good particles in a low flow that you don't want. Okay. Electrochemical parameters or potential parameters are also important, like pH. So in here we have a, a mistake, the age should be higher and also EH, conductivity and so on. Chemical regions and their addition rates and also their doses are in here. The pump level inside of the cells, it's key component also. I'm going to show you some fun pictures in a few minutes. The airflow rates inside of the cell, also important. And guys, I didn't put this video in here, but it's quite funny. Just go on YouTube and type why not use or something like this uh, bomb uh is the name is bomb soap uh, something like that bomb soap in jet tube okay and the, the girl just took like this ball and it's made of soap it's like ball like this and it's a bomb soap okay so it's a bathtub but it's a it's called a bomb why because when you throw this soap inside of the water it has carbon uh, dioxide on it so it starts to release uh, its carbon carbonate okay so it starts to release co2 and it's going to mix the soap with the water and instantly produce the bubbles the froth but the girl she's inside of a jet tube okay so the bubbles are going to be produced by the machine itself so when she just throw this inside and turn on okay the, the bubbles the jet tub she end up being completely covered in foam and froth. Okay? But literally, you just go like one and a half meters high above the water level. Okay? So everything starts to flow and she is in the hotel room. And the hotel room is quite interesting because the tube is quite close to the, the bed. So it's quite common to have this kind of thing in UK. So everything was just floating. Okay, so guys, take care of your flow rates. Okay, so if you have too much air, it's bad. Low air is bad. You have to have the right amount of air. Okay, froth properties also. So speed, bubble side, distribution, flotability, froth stability, everything is important. Particle properties, I already told you guys about this. Mineralogical composition, mineral concentration in the feed, in the concentration and in the tailings, because you are going to have not only a mass division, 
a mass split, but also a water split. Okay, so take care and take consideration of the three flows. Okay, and one thing that people do a lot in Brazil is they collect some samples from the head, from the feet, and they analyze a few samples of the feet, and then they perform flotation on the lab or scale or industrial scale, and then they analyze just one flow. For example, just the constant. And they took all the tailings out. Okay, so they take as granted that the feed is going to be the same, and that's not the case at all. Okay, and they measure only the concentrate and they estimate the tailings. Okay, why they do this? Because it's cheaper and because it's easier to calculate. But the right thing to do is collect some samples from the feed, analyze all the concentrate, and analyze all the tailings then you estimate your feed and then you can evaluate the error that you're committing or that you're at least having by doing this, this procedure okay because it's impossible to analyze everything so analyze a few samples of the feed and then double check with the calculator or estimated feed coming from the analyze of concentrated tailings and then just input the error it's not that difficult to calculate Use a Lagrangian function and just add the error to your system. Okay, you gotta add the error. Okay, otherwise you're not gonna be able to fully understand what is happening in your flotation system. Okay, so last but not least, froth wash water height. Okay, and in some machines we can have wash water, but it's not in all machines, and I'm gonna show you guys this. Okay. So here we have another video and now we're going to change the chemical. We're going to left behind collectors and we're going to move forward to the frotters. So frotter is another, another component that's quite similar with the collector. They are also surfactants, so in the same group. But now I don't want to have the frotter interaction with the mineral part. That's not the case. I want to have the frotter having interactions with the bubble, okay, with the interface liquid gas. And I'm going to show you a video. I, I ask you to pay attention to this video because in the first part of the video, it's pretty much what I, I showed you before. We're just going to have regular air and water system, okay? But then out of the blue, someone is going to drop a few, a few drops of frother on top of our system and then the magic is gonna happen okay so i'm gonna play this and let's see if you can figure it out when the flutter is going to be added to the system okay the frother acts to preserve a high population of small bubbles which benefits particle collection the bubble size in the laboratory cell is relatively large as the small bubbles are quickly coalescing to form bigger ones in this example, we can clearly see the effect of adding frother. When frother is added, the small bubble size is stabilized and the effects are obvious. Okay, so you change completely your system, okay? So now guys, I want to show you a little bit about the chemistry of the frother. And if you take a look at this, it's the chem same chemistry or looks like the same chemistry of the collector, okay? You still have the, the polar group, and in this case is a hydroxylic group and you still have the hydrocarbon chain okay so by looking at this it's similar and it is similar okay at the air water interface the frother molecule will arrange or orient itself with the hydrocarbon chain on the air side of the interface and the oh minus or hydroxyl group on the water side the hydroxyl group as we have seen is hydrophilic while the hydrocarbon chain is hydrophobic. Frother is essential to maintain a high population of small bubbles in the pulp. Uh, guys, I brought this visualization for you and I think it's quite nice because on the top, we have three different pictures. Pure water, Triton X100, in a concentration of 0.05 at 10 minus three, and then 3.6 okay so the 10 minus 3 is the same so 0, 0.0 and 3.6 
And by taking a look at this, I can see that geometry of the particles, of the bubbles, are different. But only looking at this, it looks like the same, the same amount of particles, of bubbles. It doesn't draw a lot of attention, okay? If I take a look to the figure four, figure on the bottom of my slide, what do we have in here? The same solution, the same amount of frother, but in three different airflow rates, okay? So again, if I just take a picture and take a look at the froth or the bubbles that are going to form the froth in the end, it's quite difficult to just take a look at this and say, okay, here we have more air, or in here I have better shape of my bubble, I have more spherical bubbles. Okay? But then again, I can make more things about this. I can have a setup like this, and this setup, it's quite simple. I have a lamp, I have something like a diffuser on the other side. I just need the, the light to go, uh, reflect in the diffuser and come back. And in some case, I can put the lamp on the other side, okay, and just capture the light directly. But I have a high-speed camera. The most important thing is to have a high-speed camera. And then I just produce the air inside of this aquarium uh, glass structure. Okay, And then I can have these videos like this. I can literally record the bubbles going up has to be a high speed camera because i want to make a particle tracking in this kind of system and by doing this i can map bubbles coalescence bubbles getting bigger bubbles breaking and so on and so on okay so this video is going to show you guys how the bubbles move upward and how the software works. So the software is going to look at the bubble, is going to color the bubble, and is going to label the bubble. And it's going to identify the bubble, and that's the bubble tracking that I mentioned to you. So I'm going to play it again, so you can see on the uh, second time, okay? So just see this. It's going to give color to the bubble interface, to the bubble uh, outside, just in order to the size of the bubbles, okay? So after that, what I'm going to have is, oh, sorry, let's move on, a particle size distribution. So by taking a look at this figure right now, so it's completely different than the two that I showed you before, okay? So now I will have the histogram. And when I take a look at the histogram, it's quite clear to me that when I increase the amount of frother in my solution, okay, because it's not a pool, it's just a solution, What's going to happen is the average size of the bubble decreased and at the same time, the standard deviation of the particle, di no, sorry, the bubble diameter also decreased. So we still have like a normal distribution, a Gaussian distribution, but the average slow uh, moved down a little bit, slowly, but moved down a little bit and also the standard deviation reduced, okay? And if I go now, not for changing in the in the concentration of the frother, but on the other hand, the airflow, what I'm going to see is I'm going to spread the particle size distribution, okay? So if I put more, a higher flow rate, I'm going to have a broader particle size distribution. And I'm going to end up increasing the mean diameter of my particles of my bubbles okay so you have to ch choose and choose wisely what is the best scenario for your flotation okay and there is no recipe okay there's no way to say to you guys just oh use this and this and that's the better system that you can have okay that's not the case so in here we have two bubbles okay and they're going to go up together and we have the F150, which is also a frother, and we have only 50 ppm of it. And on the other hand, we have tap water. And when we play it, what are we going to see is the difference, take a look at this, the difference in the particle, what? In the particle shape, okay? And it's quite interesting how the bubble is going to be completely different in one case and in the other case, okay? So quite impressive if you take a look at the results that we can get have when we just add frother to the system, okay? So guys, frother behaves like soap, okay? So if we do this analogy, frothers are soap, 
flotation cell is a bubble bath. Okay. So in the end, we have a bath tube in our hands. Okay. So one thing that can happen is no soap. See, so if I have no soap, I have no frother. If I have no frother, no froth bed. Okay. So I don't have that froth zone. And if I don't have froth zone, there is no flotation. And that's the first picture that you can see on my left hand side. Okay. So no flotation at all. But if you start to add soap to your water, you're going to see froth be being formed. Okay. But then again, I don't have enough soap in this case. So I don't have enough frother in this case. What I'm going to see is holes in the froth bed. As you can see over here, you can see part of the, the woman's leg. You can see part of her feet because you have holes in your froth. Okay. So these two scenarios are no good for flotation. Okay. Avoid those. So all the two scenarios that are no good for flotation, if you have too much soap, if you have kids and I have three, and if you let them around uh, froth or bubble bath, eventually they're going to end up like this. Okay, and you're gonna have a lot of trouble to clean your bathroom, but it's quite fun, okay? And everybody likes and enjoy this, but it's not okay for flotation, okay? And probably you guys are thinking that's not gonna happen. I, I doubt that industrially speaking, there's gonna be somewhere around the world that this guy is gonna put too much froth and you're gonna end up having something stupid like that. Yeah, that's not entirely the case, my friends. That's not entirely the case. But on my right hand side, you can see another thing that's quite interesting, the cell level. And if you consider that that's also not something that is not going to happen, trust me, that's the main cause for errors when you try to perform flotation on your lab. Okay. So when you talk about lab scale, you have to start flotation. And after a few minutes, what's going to happen is the material is coming out. Okay. The froth is coming out and the pulp level inside of the cell is going to reduce and by reducing the, the, the level inside of your cell, you don't have flotation anymore. Actually, you do have flotation, but the froth doesn't come out by itself. So you have to add water. Okay. So you have to replace water in the system in order to increase the pulp level and to allow your froth to come out of the machine. Okay. But actually, if you send the students to do this, or if you don't give proper trainer to the operators, they just keep adding water, water and water. And instead of having just the froth coming out of your equipment, you have poop overflowing out of your equipment. And that's terrible. That's really, really terrible. Why? Because you're taking material, not from the froth bed, but from the layer below it. Okay. So you're instantly contaminating your concentrate. Okay. So don't do this. So four scenarios that not okay for flotation. Okay. Avoid this at all costs. So in here, I have a picture. This is a real picture from Catalon. And I was visiting the company and take a look at what kind of froth they were producing at the time that I was there. Okay. And it is what it is. They produce this. It, this is good. No, this is terrible. This is a terrible froth. Okay. Something was wrong with the process. Okay. So that's why you need operators. Definitely you need automation. It's maximum automation that you can have, but you need boots on ground. Okay. You need people to go there and take a look and see what is happening. And guys, I'm not sure if you can see in here, this color in here. But I, I was able to see some things in my life, in my professional life, that's going to sound like a lie. Okay. Because if someone tells me this, and I, if I wasn't aware that this is actually true, I definitely was going to believe myself. Okay. But I could see a guy that he was so trained, so developed in this kind of flotation that he could take a sample of the froth, just go and spread this froth on that part of the flotation over there. And by looking at the color of the froth, he could guess the grade of the material. Okay. And he actually could do it. Just like uh, 
my, giving or taking like 3% of the grade of the material, okay? So the material would be like 35% is the, the normal, 35% of P2O5. If it was like below 32, the guy could see. He could actually look at it and said, oh, it's below the threshold, okay? So this is not okay. This is a bad flotation, just like three points. And again, people can eventually have this power because the guy was working in the company for over 30 years. So in the end, you stabilize some synapses and you can have this information and it's quite helpful, okay? So if you guys could actually balance your soap and the water, then you can reach a good enough frother water relation and then you're gonna have a nice froth bath and then you're gonna have potentially speaking a good flotation system okay but taking this into consideration okay you can have a great froth and the worst collector you're not gonna have flotation okay you can have a great froth you can have a great collector but you don't have the present and then you don't have flotation if you have all those three that I mentioned before, but in the wrong pH, and then you don't have flotation. So you have to take a look at everything. Flotation, it's complicated, okay? And it's complex. Also remember this. And here I want just to show you guys how can we actually measure the level inside the flotation cell? Because we have two interfaces, okay? We have the pulp, and froth interface, and definitely have the froth air interface on the top of everything. So if I just take uh, a look at my flotation cell and try to guess the level, I'm gonna guess the level by what interface? Froth air interface. I can see through the froth. And that's why normally we use a system like this, okay? We have a hydro, a ultrasonic, sorry, ultrasonic system on the top, okay? just a second someone wants to join us okay so i have this ultrasound system on the top and i have flutter in the in the liquid froth uh, interface so this flutter is going up and down according with the, the pulp level okay and i can just take a look at the floater and that's why i have this thing this disc metallic disc on the top of the floater and then the ultrasound is going to be emitted it's going to hit this round disc and it's going to come back okay and then actually i measure the distance between my sensor and the disc okay because i know how much is the di the distance between the disc and the floater okay the two most common methods of level measurement in flotation cells are floats and or ultrasonic probes Floats can be used on their own to mechanically measure pulp level or in combination with ultrasonic probes which measure the position of the float. Ultrasonic probes measure distance by gauging the amount of time sound waves take to travel from the probe to the surface and back again. Once the level can be measured, dart valves can be used to maintain the level at a desired set point. So as you can see on this picture over here, this is actually from Catalog and you can see some instruments some sensors in here but you can see the same disc that i mentioned to you before in here and that's the floater okay so in this case it wasn't working so good because as you can see over here the floater is almost on the froth bath so actually i don't have a good froth bed in this flotation that was the problem okay the froth is just very very time bad okay so i should be taking a look at this froth bed but the system on how can I measure the interface, it's right there, okay? So people, again, if I add frother, if I increase the amount of frother, I'm going to reduce the size of my particles, of my bubbles, okay? So I continue reducing the bubble size. So the graphic in the bottle is showing you this, okay? And then we have five points that the guys went there and make the measurements. So let's start with the smallest part, bubble size that we have, okay? So it would be this one for 25 ppm of frother. Which frother doesn't, it doesn't matter right now, but just for you to know is DF250, okay? 
So if I take a look at this, it's going to be the same particle, sorry, the bubble size in here and the same bubble size in here. Okay, so the average bubble size will be like one, so it is one millimeter. Okay, but when I take a look at this, take a look at this distribution. Okay, so if you look at this distribution, the one millimeter is going to be here. It's not the mean size. Okay, and the one millimeter in here is pretty much the mean size. But when I take a look at this over here, it's a little bit coarser than one millimeter, but then this starts to happen. Okay, and this is actually a binomial distribution. So I have actually two averages in here. So it's two distributions. And this became even more clear when I take a look at this and this. Oh my friend, this is right there. You don't have one bubble size distribution, you have two. So we have small bubbles and we have coarse bubbles, okay? And they are all together in the same machine. And that's why Frotter do this amazing job of changing completely the hydrodynamics inside my cell, okay? Or my column, because they took these two distributions and they just kill one of those, okay? And you end up having just one distribution, okay? Again, Frotters are quite nice. And if I take a look at the pictures, that's what I'm going to see, okay? so. Those pictures are better than the first one that I showed to you because in here we can see the difference. There are differences between the five pictures. Okay, it's quite clear to everyone. So I brought you guys just for curiosity. Okay, just some examples of typical families of frotters or frotting agents. Also, the same significant. Okay, so you can say floating frotters or frotting agents. So we have alcohol types, we have aromatic types, we have uh, alkoxy types, and we have polyglycol types. Okay? And almost all frotters are going to be in one of those categories over there. Okay. Normally, when you take a look at the paper, you're going to see something like this. They're going to put the industrial name or the market name of the regions. Okay. Sometimes you can see the chemical formula. Okay, it's not so common because it's going to to realize on the supplier to give you the formula. Okay, so not always they're going to be able just to hand over to you the formula, but definitely they provide you with the molecular weight. Okay, so as you can see over here in this paper, and I strongly recommend you that take a look at this paper. It's from Jim Finch. You're going to see that. If you go from one frother to the other, what they are actually doing is just to increase the molecular weight. They are just increasing, increasing, increasing the molecular weight. And then they are going to show you the result of this increase in the flotation system. What I can tell you for sure is when we float gold in our lab, we always, always try to use a high molecular weight for our frother because the result for gold is better. Okay. But that's going to depend on what kind of mineral you're full of. Okay. So in here we have another video, and this video is now for a different chemical. That's for activators. And activators, it's if you thought right now that flotation is a clever machine, is a clever technique, you're gonna be mesmerized by the idea of activators. Okay. So consider something right now. You take your mineral and you try everything that you can, and you can't float the material. Okay. Why? For example, you don't have a collector for this. Or if you try to add the collector, the collector is going to collect not only the particle that you want, but also all the gang minerals. So you can find a way or you can tune your system in order to selectively flotate just one mineral and then activate the scan. Okay? There are no activators for all minerals. Okay? So we still have a long way to go to better understand this. But for some minerals, we do have activators. So let's take a look on what is going to happen with this part. Collector molecules are unable to adsorb onto the surface of sphalerite or zinc sulfide. Copper sulfate dissolves in water, leading to the formation of copper and sulfate ions. The copper ions will exchange for some of the zinc atoms at the surface of the mineral. To the collector, the particle surface now appears to be made of copper sulfide, not zinc sulfide the collector is able to absorb and the particle becomes hydrophobic. If I add copper okay, in the solution, I'm going to replace zinc to copper. 
in the chemical structure of lime mineral, but only the surface. And then the same collector that wasn't able to collect sphalerite is going to be able to collect the copper because this collector, this sentate, it's going to look and see now copper and not zinc and copper, he can do it, okay? And now there is synergy. So it's quite clever because I can make flotation directly, okay? So I'm gonna actually make a trap for my collector. I'm going to just do, literally, I'm going to shit my collector, okay? So I'm going to trick my collector, okay? So I'm going to be the trickster that is going to trick the collector and the collector is going to actually fall for this, okay? So in here we have another example and it's a, Rio flotation system in the lab. Sphalerite is naturally hydrophilic. It also does not react easily with collectors. Therefore, in order to float sphalerite, it is necessary to activate it. In this laboratory experiment, an attempt is made to float sphalerite without activator. As can be seen by the whitish color, the loading in the froth is quite low and recovery is near zero. Once activator is added, the results are quite different. The sphalerite floats quickly, forming a brownish froth loaded with particles. Recovery is high. Okay, and it's quite interesting. And it's not only for the sphalerite. So if you take a look at the pentlandite, it's going to be the same. Pentlandite is also a sulfate, but it's an iron nickel sulfate. So if you take this and put some, what? Some activators, in this case, copper sulfate, then you can allow your collector to actually go there and collect your pentland light okay so again guys one thing that you should keep in inside is if i can't float it maybe i can activate my mineral and then i can float okay it's really clever it's it's impressive how the people had this idea but it actually works but on the other hand it can also backfire on you Okay, so this case, for example, I want to use OHA, it's octyl hydroxamic acid, and I want to use this as a collector. Okay, and I'm going to float it perovskite, which is a calcium titanium oxide. And if I add this OHA directly, I can't float. Okay, it's not going to work because I need an activator. And in this case, I use lead. Okay, and by put lead on this solution, I can activate the perovskite surface and then I can have flotation. But consider this, how about my gang minerals? Because I can have a system that the gang minerals are soluble and they are going to be releasing ions also, okay? And they're going to be exchanging ions with the solution. So take care of not having an activation of everything that you have, okay? Because if you activate also the gang minerals, you don't have selectivity anymore, okay? So consider this, you need to activate, but you need to activate only the particles that you want to float, okay? And then you're being clever, okay? So guys, another thing that we can also do as modificators is dispersion, okay? So let's take a look at this video. And before we play it, let's take a look at this picture. What I'm seeing over here is a big particle, coarse particle, and they can see that attached to it, to it, I have very fine particles. That's what we call slime coating, because my particle is being coated with slimes, okay? And I don't want to have this. I want to get rid of these fine particles, especially if I can do this in the desliming, okay? If not, I don't want to have these fine particles in flotation. They are no good for flotation at all. Okay, and if the fine particles are actually coating my coarse particle, I'm not going to be able to actually float the, the coarse particle because my collector is not going to find, it's not going to see the coarse particle. So then again, I can actually be clever and enter with another chemical called it dispersant. And this dispersant is quite nice because when I put it into solution, I'm going to do what? I'm going to remove the final particles, chemically speaking. And by doing this, I enable the coarse particle to be floated. The addition of certain chemicals known as dispersants can have a depressing effect on very fine particles. These reagents disperse the slimes which often agglomerate and cover the surfaces of larger particles, therefore preventing them from being recovered. One thing that you can also do is 
this and remove this slime coating okay by uh, use of mechanical force okay you have this attrition cell and you can apply attrition to your system and then you're going to remove these slime particles by attrition okay so it's quite regular to have this attrition works a lot in many scenarios but in others you need to have this percent okay in this case in this particular case it's a very beautiful video uh, it's going to show you this percent in action but not for mineral processing it looks like mineral processing have everything to do with mineral processing but that's actually for ink and ink pigment the role of a dispersant is to adsorb onto the pigment surface prevent flocculation of the pigment particle during milling resulting in a stable pigment dispersion Dispersants provide several key benefits during both formulation and final appearance, such as reducing milling time and viscosity, improving appearance, and enhancing final coating properties. A dispersant consists of two parts, an anchoring segment that adsorbs onto the pigment and a polymeric chain that creates a steric barrier that stabilizes the dispersant. Lubrizol's Solspurs polymeric dispersants also known as hyperdispersants, are polymeric materials designed to offer significantly higher levels of performance. They are typically higher molecular weight, and this means they may contain multiple anchoring groups and stabilization chains. They can be tailored to work across a broader range of pigments or fillers and in different media. Due to their unique structure, polymeric dispersants can provide specific benefits to formulators and end product manufacturers. Higher quality, improved flexibility, increased productivity. There are multiple methods to stabilize a pigment in a medium, but electrostatic and steric are the two main types. Electrostatic stabilization, also known as charge stabilization, uses electromagnetic forces to achieve particle separation. It is effective only in high polarity systems like water. Steric stabilization, which physically separates the particles, was originally designed for use in low to medium polarity systems, but its use has been extended for all polarities. The dominant mechanism for stabilization with Solspurs hyperdispersants is steric. Dispersants are two component structures. The anchoring group provides strong adsorption onto the pigment surface. Polymeric chains, which are attached to the anchor group, provide the stabilization. It is the particular combination of the anchoring group and polymeric chains which leads to the effectiveness of hyperdispersants. Single anchor, single chain structures are polymers with terminal function groups. They are fast wetting and good with grind resins. Single anchor dispersants by their nature only contain one type of anchoring group. Therefore, they are most effective on a single class of pigments. Multi-anchor or multi-chain structures, also known as comb copolymers, are better for long-term stability and broad pigment compatibility. This is due to the fact that they can contain multiple types of anchor technology to work across a broad range of pigments. When choosing the right dispersant, there are several key factors to consider. A dispersion typically consists of pigments or fillers, solvents, resins, and dispersant. The first factor in choosing the right dispersant is the type of particle being dispersed. Organic, carbon black, inorganic, or fillers. Each one has a different surface chemistry and structure. The dispersant needs to anchor strongly onto the pigment or filler, and different pigments can have very different surface chemistry. Inorganic pigments and fillers disperse best with acidic or anionic anchor groups. Organic pigments and carbon black disperse best with basic or cationic anchor groups. This is represented by the outer part of the wheel. The second factor to consider is the system. 
The dispersant must be soluble and compatible with the solvent and resin system to get a good stable dispersion. This is represented by each section of the wheel. The third factor which influences dispersant choice are the application and processing conditions. With some difficult to stabilize organic and carbon black pigments, the use of a Solsperse Synergist can enhance the performance of the polymeric dispersant. This is represented by the outer ring. Lubrizol maintains a portfolio of hyperdispersants for a wide range of solvents and pigment types. Implementing these steps will result in a low viscosity, high color strength, stable dispersion. After choosing the preferred dispersant, the optimum amount of hyperdispersant required is dependent on the surface area of the pigment. If too little is used, the full benefits will not be realized. If too much is used, the thickness of the protective barrier is reduced as a result of overcrowding on the pigment surface. Performance properties are optimized at the correct dosage. Viscosity and particle size are at a minimum and appearance properties are maximized. Through experimentation, it has generally been established that the theoretical dosage level of a hyperdispersant in a pigment dispersion equates to 2 mg of dispersant per square meter of pigment surface area. This can be expressed as percent agent on the weight of pigment, or percent AOWP. Percent AOWP equal BET surface area meters squared per gram divided by 5. Implementing these steps will result in a low viscosity, high color strength, stable dispersion. So guys, let's talk about the presence right now, okay? So let's see this video and let's understand what this chemical also can give to us, okay? Depressants prevent flotation of a particular mineral which otherwise would float. In this laboratory experiment, pyrite is first floated under ideal conditions using xanthate. As you can see, the froth is heavily loaded. Pyrite recovery is high. The process is repeated, this time after adding a small amount of cyanide to depress the pyrite. As you can see, the froth is now white and barren. Very little pyrite has floated. So the depressant in this case has been used in a different way. That's not the, the way that we, normally we use it. Normally we want to do what? Depress the gang minerals. Okay, so you just add the depressant in order to depress the gang minerals, not to allow the gang to float it together with the material that you want. I want to show you pyrite surface with cyanide, which is that video that I showed you before, but I showed you for the mineral itself. In here is just a visualization of the chemical formula or the mineralogical structure. And as you can see over here, we have the pyrite surface represented by iron and sulfur. And when I add cyanide, what it's going to do is I'm going to have an absorption of the cyanide on the surface of the pyrite. Certain depressants can adsorb onto the surface of a mineral in preference to collector. Cyanide, starches, and CMC are examples of depressants which can act this way. This has two effects. First, collectors are not able to adsorb and make the particle hydrophobic. Second, the depressants have hydrophilic groups which makes the particle even less likely to float. Some depressants are able to remove certain surface species. Data and cyanide can join with metal ions, removing them from the surface where they otherwise react with collector. Xanthate, as we have seen, adsorbs on a sulfide mineral through a reaction which requires the pulp potential to be in a certain range. Reagents which lower this potential can therefore prevent collector adsorption. These reagents include sulfur dioxide, metabisulfite, and cyanide. Oxygen is required as part of the reaction for collector adsorption. Thus, lowering the amount available will slow down flotation. The use of nitrogen in place of air for flotation and heating the pulp are two approaches to lowering oxygen content. Raising the amount of oxygen available can lead to the formation of hydrophilic oxidation products on the surface of certain minerals. Aeration is often used to depress pyrite. And that's also really impressive because if you consider flotation, we have many, many, many 
parameters that I have to take care of. So in here is just some examples. And there are many. The literature is crawling of examples of diff different depressants because every mineral group that you intend to work with, you're going to have a huge gamma of chemicals okay then you go exactly for collector depressant activator and so on okay clarion they used to give us some souvenirs and one that is quite nice it's a very big poster with all of the chemicals for the major minerals that will perform flotation on it and it's huge and and the font is just like this side the type is really small it's like 10 in a very big frame okay so yeah there are a lot of chemicals okay and every day they release new chemicals so cyanide is quite common mbs eda dta sulfonates cmc standard depressor also guargan and the brazilian best one or the favorite in brazil is starch especially corn starch why because it's cheap is highly available and works like a charm okay so if you go to mineral processing and you focus on iron ore definitely you're gonna end up using starch and we use starch because hematite can be depressed very easily if you use corn starch okay one thing that we have to consider when they say starch is actually we have byproducts with the starch production in brazil Okay, and we have many names for this. And we even use this in our local cuisine. Okay, but one thing that we actually use in our minds is called locally called fubá, which is not a grits of our corn. It's like a, a corn flour, but it's actually not corn flour. Okay, because we have corn flour, we have fubá, and we have many other grain size grinded, uh, starting with corn. Okay, so corn grinded in different size one of those we call it fubá and fubá is the main uh, depressant for this so again it's cheap highly available it's organic is renewable and that is only qualities okay so in this graphic you can see the flotability of hematite as a function of the concentration of the depressant and in this case it was used starch amylosis and myelopectin we consider that the starch is almost 100 percent amylose plus amylopectin we know that it's not only this okay but it's mainly composed by this and this this graphic came in from the paper from Professor Antonio Perez in Brazil. He's a Brazilian. He's a very well-known uh, researcher here in Brazil and also in the world regarding flotation. And as you can see, starch has very similar results than when you use amylose. And amylopectin is the better one. Okay, it's going to depress almost everything. It's going to reduce almost to zero the hematite flotability. And if you consider this, it's zero point something. So it's less than what you're going to have only by hydraulic entrainment. So you could consider zero. Okay, it's capable of put all hematite depressed in the bottom of your halimum tube and the collector that you're going to use in this system is an amine or an amine derivative and as you can see it's going to remove completely the hematite out of the equation not going to float the hematite anymore and in our lab we try to take a look in a different starch source and this is this was actually the phd of professor Enice silva also my wife and we worked together in our mineral processing lab for over 11 years and she worked with sorghum i guess now for seven years so she went to this characterization she actually characterized everything regarding sorghum and double check with the cornstarch and she could extract not only the flower of the sorghum but also the starch the sorghum starch and she performed the flotation test okay and just for curiosity here you can see some sem images comparing sorghum starch sorghum flower and corn starch corn starch is the first one on the left hand side and sorghum starch the top one on the right hand side the bottom part you can see sorghum flower so after the 
the removal of the impurities and you end up only with the starch, you have more spherical particles and sorghum for many applications that we tested so far is a better depressant than corn starch and it's cheaper okay and in brazil it's not edible so one good thing is you can produce sorghum in areas that you can produce corn you can eat or at least you don't eat sorghum in brazil nowadays and it's profitable so why not move the the mineral area into sorghum and away from corn because corn is food okay and you also use this as feeding for animals guys another thing that is also paramount important is the ph and i'm going to show you this video and the the author is going to change the ph of the poop during the flotation and you're going to see the results of doing this okay and if we're going to understand the ph influence in the flotation system we had to have like at least eight hours studying only this because then we have to have that graphics that showed us the chemical species that we're gonna have in every single points of the pH variation, for example, and then we start to analyze what is gonna happen with our chemicals in those specific pH. And then we're gonna take a look at the chem uh, the minerals on those specific pH. Because if you change the pH, I change the surface charge of our, my mineral. Okay, and I'm gonna show a graphic about this in a few minutes. And on the other hand side, on the other hand, sorry, if I change the pH, I change also the composition of my chemicals. So I have to couple the two. And let's take a look at this. A sample of pyrite placed into a laboratory float cell at pH 6 floats quite readily with the addition of a small amount of xanthate. The froth is heavily loaded, giving a metallic shine. Pyrite recovery is high. If we raise the pH by adding a base, we are essentially adding OH- ions. This effect slows the reaction of collector with the mineral, and less collector is able to adsorb onto the mineral surface. The pH at which this effect occurs depends on which mineral is being floated. At pH 10, the same pyrite sample shows very little response to flotation. The froth is white and barren. Recovery is low. Now we don't have uh, minerals anymore in the froth because the collector changed his speci speciation and it's not acting like the collector anymore. Okay, so if you take a look at the amine and amine groups, according with the pH that you're working with, you can have a mine working as or behaving as a collector or behaving as a frother. Okay? So you have to be extra careful with your pH and you have to control your pH. Otherwise, you're going to ruin your product. Okay, So let's move ahead. Remember when I mentioned to you that I'm going to show you about this surface of the mineral and change the charge according to pH. That's called zeta potential. Okay, so it's quite important if you could track and measure the zeta potential of your minerals. So one thing that is difficult is I can't make this zeta potential measurement on my ore. I have to have only pure crystals of my minerals. Okay, so in this case, we're working with amatite and quartz and we could separate. We had only amatite and only quartz. Then we went to this equipment, zeta meter, and there are like five different zeta meters in the market. And I'm not talking about manufacturers. I'm talking about the technology they use to produce the machine. Okay. And I could measure, for example, the quartz, and I couldn't find this point when I changed the surface charge. And this is called zero point charge. Okay. And zero charge point sorry and on this zero point charge what has happened is the surface charge of my mineral is zero okay and as you can see quartz is always negative and nematite is always positive so if we try to perform a flotation okay and i want to float with quartz that's the reverse cationic flotation of iron ore i could actually think about taking something on the acid uh, zone of my pH 
Okay, and if I try to go to acid, what kind of chemicals I need? I need something that would be positive in order to adsorb on the quartz surface, but that's only one type of adsorption. I can have a physisorption, which would be a physical adsorption of my collector, and also I can have a chemical adsorption, okay? And you call this chemisorption. And if I use chemisorption, then I have to have a positive collector. And on the other hand, hematite is also positive, so maybe I don't have this interaction. But that's not the way that, that we do this. Okay? We prefer to use amine on the alkaline base, and both minerals are going to be negative. I know this, but if I add starch first, the hematite has more affinity with the starch than quartz. So hematite prefer interact with starch, okay? And that's what's going to happen. And by doing this, I'm going to coat my hematite particles with starch, and I'm not going to let any pieces of hematite in order to interact with a mine. And then when I add a mine, the amine is go straight to the surface of quartz, and then it can float, okay? And works like a charm. Another graphic that I brought to you is about appetite, and as you can see, no zero charge point also only negative for appetite then it would be like pointless try to work in an acid ph because it's always negative and as much ne negative that i could reach it's going to be easier for us to float so that's why normally we almost always choose a ph between seven in some cases we also try seven here in catalan up to 10 for the appetite flotation again we have to take care into also a uh, deep look with the gang minerals so i have to take care also to, with the other minerals present in my ore not only the mineral that i want to float but in this case appetite can easily be floated around nine okay so that works and here we have another video and i'm gonna ask you guys just to follow a little bit because i know that i didn't mention to you or explain to you what is the recovery, what is grace, and the, the maths behind this. But just let take a look at this. And next lecture, I'm going to teach you how to calculate this. And I know that is important, but this video, I think it's self explanation. Okay. So here we have two curves, pyrite and calcopyrite. And as you can see over the pH, the recovery, the amount of material that I can take back from my slurry is different according to the pH. So if I take this pH, this first pH, it doesn't matter the number. If I take this two, I'm going to have a high recovery of both minerals. But if I change the pH, I'm going to have 9% of charcoal pyrite and only 20% of the pyrite being recovered, which means only 20% of the pyrite that I put in my flotation system, I'm going to get back in my concentrate, okay? So if I want to separate pyrite from chalcopyrite, pyrite, that's the way to do it, okay? I just have to set up the pH, and we know that pH regulation, it's easy, okay? So we get instantly selectivity, okay? Quite good. So in here, in this picture, I brought to you four different pH meters, and all of those from companies here in Catalan, okay? And one thing is quite interesting. You can establish a set point for these pH meters. Of course, it's definitely standard for almost all equipments like this. So the guys, they are quite funny. They put a, an emoji, a happy face on the pH meter. So if you take a look at this one, you can see over here a smiley face. So when you see a happy face, it, which means your pH is okay, it's adequate to this process. So in this case, the pH was 9.16, okay? So if you take a look at this other one, oh, the, the face is not smiling, it's a regular, it's a plain face, it's a regular face, so the pH was 8.93, okay? But they are two different flotations, that's why I'm showing you this. So in this flotation, the pH was 9.62, and the face is quite sad. Okay, and this other one, 6.18, and the face set. Okay, and if you think that the pH is varying a lot, just take a look at this other one. This one was performed at pH 3. Okay, so why we have so many different pHs? Because actually, this is part of the niobium production route. 
and I have one flotation for carbonates, one flotation for silicates, and then a flotation for niobium itself, okay? And I have different pH for every single one of those flotations. And even inside of the same flotation, flotation for the one mineral or mineral group, I can have different in the pH. Oh, guys, this is normal, okay? You have to understand that you need to know what pH you have to use in order to actually do a good flotation, okay? So take a look at this, and this is for true. So coming back to math, okay, we can establish the flotation probability. There are many models regarding flotation. I'm just going to show you one, okay, because it's the simplest model that we can have. And it's not the better one, of course, but actually it does the trick, okay? What is going to happen here is the probability of having flotation would be a split among three other probabilities. A probability of having a collision between the particle and the bubble, a probability of having the attachment of the particle to the bubble, and lastly, a probability of having the detachment of the particle away from the bubble. So if I multiply the collision this, the attach, uh, by the attachment, sorry, and multiply by the one minus the detachment probability would be the probability of not have the detachment, then I have the probability of having flotation itself. Okay. Actually, I can calculate the probability of having collision or having attachment and also have the detachment because I can correlate the, those probabilities with some industrial results and some lab results that can give me a very good idea on how I can I estimate those numbers, okay, those figures. And for example, I brought to you just the PC would be the probability of collision. And the probability of collision depends of course, of the bubble size and the particle size, okay? It's just for curiosity. And in here, I brought to you another video, and this video is going to show you the detachment of a particle. Particles attached to bubbles are subject to many forces that can cause detachment or separation from the bubble. Here, a rising bubble loses some of the larger attached particles due to the turbulent action of the pulp. Particles can also detach simply due to the force of gravity pulling on them, or even due to the sudden deceleration they experience when the bubbles reach the base of the froth. All these mechanisms together make our flotation even more and more complicated. Guys, I brought to you just some slides about flotation machines. And one thing that is for sure, that when we start flotation in the beginning of 90s, we start flotation cells with something like one cubic meter as volume. And one thing that we stayed for almost 20 years was the same size. And then we double the size. Okay, oh, let's go for two cubic meters. And this remains for almost 20 years. And then people start to increase the volumes. And nowadays we can tell you for sure that big tanks, we call this tank cell, they are quite good for flotation. We don't want to have a lot of walls effect in our flotation system. And that's why this graphic is almost exponential. And as you can see from 2000 on, we we change from something like 160 and now we reach something like 350 cubic meters. Okay, And this is huge amount of material inside of just one tank. And it's mesmerizing how the flotation is, is drawing every single part of the equipment and then you increase your results okay this is really really strange on the other side it's beautiful okay well one thing that we also have to consider is when we go for a flotation we don't go for just one machine okay we saw that we can have big machines big cells but we don't put just one first of all because we have to have very clear what every part of my circuit is doing and that's why normally we divide our flotation circuit in three parts okay but it's we can have more than three and we can have eventually even less than three normally we have rough flotation scavenger flotation and cleaner flotation what is the hoffer or the rough flotation the hoffer cell it was the first cell, as you can see over there, we have just the circuit feed going straight to the rougher cell. 
and it's the first cut, okay? So in the rough cell, I'm not aiming or having a high grade of our concentrate. I just want to have recovery. I want mass, okay? Of course, I want to remove some impurities, but not all, okay? I'm going to have more cells I had to do this. And that's why I normally have something like five or even more banks on this flotation stage. So every single square that you've seen over it here are one bank. So in here we have what? One, two, three, four, five rougher stages. And this is actually the standard symbol for a flotation cell, okay? So after having this rougher flotation, what I'm gonna have in my hand? I'm gonna have my concentrate and my tailing, okay? But this tailing, we still have material on it. We still have ore on it. And we don't want just to throw it out, okay? So we're gonna give it another chance, okay? And by giving it another chance, I'm talking about scavenger cell, okay? So I'm gonna feed this material in a scavenger. And if you don't know what is a scavenger, is that, people or animal who goes to the garbage and who's going to throw the garbage around and is going to find something good inside of the bed, inside of the garbage. It's going to try to get something out of that. And that's what my cell is going to do. It's going to try to collect more material that I can sell it inside of my trash. Okay, so it's going to try it again. It's our last time, our last chance to get my material back, my ideal mineral back, okay? So normally, okay, we're gonna have a larger size and number of banks because again, it's less dry. If I'm gonna have tailings out of this, it goes straight to the tailing banks, okay? But then I got the scavenger concept. If I take a look at the chemical composition of this, it's not gonna be a final concept. It's not rich enough. And then I'm going to do what? I'm going to take the scavenger concentrate and I'm going to feed my rough flotation. Okay, I'm going to bring this back in a closed circuit into the rough flotation. Okay, and probably I'm going to feed the rough flotation with a grade higher or slightly higher than the new feed. Okay, we can actually do this or achieve this. But then let's go back to the rough flotation. Now we have the concentrate of the rough flotation. If I take a look at this, it's less mass than the feet of the circuit plus the scavenger concentrate. I could increase a little bit of my grade, but I could reach this. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna focus on grade. Now I have to upgrade the grade, and that's why I'm gonna have one or more cell banks called cleaner. I'm gonna have, it's common to have a cleaner and also a re-cleaner. And this picture is not written, recleaner, but you can see a recleaner right in here, okay? So this could be called like cleaner one, and this would be cleaner two, but we normally call this recleaner, okay? And in here we have one, two, three cells in my bank, in my cleaner bank, and only two cells, three cells, sorry, one, two, three cells on my recleaner bank, okay? So again, the cleaner concentrate is going to feed the recleaner. The, the tailings of the cleaner come back to the rougher cell. So the rough is going to get three feeds, not just only one. And the recleaner is going to be the same. Close it circuit, but now with the cleaner stage. And by doing this, by retaining the material as much as we can and increasing the residence or retaining time of my material inside of the flotation circuit, what I'm gonna get out of this, selectivity, grades, recovers, money, okay? But that's not the only way to do it. Some people just cut out the scavenger circuit or scavenger banks because they perform some analyze and see that nothing good is coming out of the scavenger, that's okay you can have this in some cases you don't have cleaner and re cleaner you can have just cleaner or not even this okay and in some cases just like chile for example they have copper and they have molybdenum so the circuit uh, the flotation circuit it's way more complicated because they have to float not only copper but also molybdenum okay and they can do this outstanding okay and then in the end they have like a final concentrate of copper, final concentrate of molybdenum, and also the tailings. So again, just keep that in mind. And when we take a look at the flotation cell bank, normally what you see is something like this, okay? We have 
many flotation cells, one by the other side, and the materials just go floating from one to the other, just moving from one into the other. And then we have, in the end, our final tailings and many concentrates among the process. Okay, And I can even redirect this concentrator to different streams or analyze those and separate or put everything together as you prefer. Okay, So I brought some pictures for you to take a look. And this could be seen as, for example, here, a rougher flotation, okay? here, a cleaner flotation, and here, a recleaner flotation. That's not the case, okay? to be completely honest. Here, we're going to have different banks of flotation, but in here, you have one, two, three, four, five, six machines, and they all are the same flotation bank. Okay? They are all floating the same materials, the same chemicals, and so on. Okay, and as you can see in this picture over here, we have flotation in both sides of the machine. Okay, that, that that's not regular in our lab or our own labs, but we have in Brazil one manufacturer and they produce one uh, cell that you can actually float and it goes two ways. Okay, so you can float on the left side and the right side at the same time. Normally, when you take a look at the these flotation cells for labs, you only remove your froth in one place okay in one side just a curiosity on how to operate and here you can see also uh, a picture a closed picture of this flotation bank and as you can see they looks like the same but they're not okay so if you sample every single one of this you're gonna see that the concentrate is going to change from one cell to the another why because actually what is changing from one cell to the another is actually the material that doesn't float on the first one, the material that was depressed, and then went to the second one, the second bank. And then we have flotation again, and the material that sank went to the third bank, and so on. So, of course, if you take a look at the concentrate, they're going to be completely different, okay? And that's it's quite visible, you can see this, okay? So, this is a slightly different machine, but the bank is still here you can see the bank and as i mentioned to you in this case all the concentrates they go together okay they're just going to be adding more concentrate and this is water okay i just want to start to break the bubbles to start to break the froth so in this ladder i'm just going to add water and going to wash the froth and moving away this is a column cell Okay, and as you can see, completely different geometry, size, and everything. And in here, it's just for us to take a look at the difference between these two. So when we talk about the mechanical flotation, or that mechanical cell that I'm showing a lot to you right now, what I'm going to have is I feed my material and I have froth plus water and tailings going down. Okay, so the same, right? all machines that is going to be classified as mechanical flotation would be roughly as the same. What is the difference for column flotation? I have wash water, okay? I can add water to wash my froth. And this water could be added on here, on the side of the equipment, but also I can put like some water raining on the top of my machine, okay? But then I'm going to wash my froth and I'm going to remove that material that is entrapped that is entrained or even particles that is slightly attached, I'm just going to remove those, okay? So the difference are, if you want to focus on grade, go for column flotation. If you have fine particles, go to column flotation. If you don't want to have any of these two mentioned before, go to mechanical flotation. And you're gonna be happy, or at least we hope that you would be happy, okay? So talking about Big machines, that's the tank cell. In this case, Autotech. Now it's matched to Autotech. And you can see the induction line is inside of it. This machine was actually proposed by professors in Canada. Finch was one of them. And this number on the side of the tank cell 300 is 300 cubic meters. Okay, so as you can see, this, by the size of the ladder that you have to climb to reach the top of the tank and I consider what is 300 cubic meters of water is a huge machine, okay? But on the other hand, if you consider the number of cells that you have put together, lined together, 
in order to reach 300 cubic meters, it's actually cheaper to have a tank cell. Okay? The mechanism to actually add energy to the system is cheaper if you go for a tank cell. So nowadays, many people are selling the old flotation machines and move into tank cells because you can actually measure the results. Okay, So this is one of the new flotation plants that people from Niobe in Catalonia are using. As you can see over here, those are tank cells and they are all operating in banks of tank cells. So yes, the, co the flotation plant becomes a little bit larger, bigger, but on the other hand, your throughput it's increases a lot okay, and you can have better results. So it's easy to sell this kind of machines. So then I brought, I put in some e slides. I brought for you some col fl column flotation and flotation columns in this first slide means the family of the equipments that could be called columns. Okay. So normally we talk about three different columns, but we're not restricted to those will be Copro, Microcell and Jameson cell. Okay. So just for you to take a look, this is a regular, uh, column flotation would be like a James flotation cell, but this co, co it's called co-pro or CPT column flotation. And it, it's slightly different from the regular ones because you have a slang jet bubble generation. And so you have like lens or you put around your machine, this picture, it's easier for you to understand this. And those lens just inject compressed air inside of your equipment and then you produce a lot of bubbles inside of it okay so what's going to ch change from one to the another is normally how you wash your bubbles or your material how you add bubbles and the geometry okay so that's the microcell column flotation technology it was invented in 1980s it was coming the idea came from virginia tech in the united states and as you can see over here it's pretty much the same Okay, it's the same idea, it's the same concept with slightly difference. And in here, the main difference is how you produce your bubble. And in this case, they produce micro bubbles. Okay, because if you go into micro bubbles, nano bubbles, then you have different chapters for flotation. And in some cases, you can have very good results if you try to work with these nano bubbles or even micro bubbles. There's some pictures assembling the equipment or just putting the equipment on the top of mineral processing plant and then after everything together what are you going to get okay and last not least we have a jameson cell and it was proposed by graham jameson and the design is quite different it's instead of having a very high flotation column you have a smaller one and it's something quite strange because you can have the same effects of a high flotation, a high column, but in a very restricted column. Okay, so just take a look at the difference on the geometry and you can see and understand why they are so different. Okay, to finish, I just brought to you a few slides about flotation that we perform on lab. So the first one in here is pyrite flotation. Actually, we have pyrite and chalco pyrite over here. This flotation was performed in Germany, and I co I'm co supervisor of this PhD. So Anna was making this flotation. Let me just play in here so you can take a look at how Anna can float this material. And as you can see, the the froth it's well mineralized. You can take a look at the froth and you can see that it's not only water. That's something different in this froth. Okay, and this is the material that Anna wants to froth and uh, float. And this material actually it's composed by very fine particles. And this material is a tailing deposited in the old tailing dams in Europe. And we're now reclaiming the tailing dams, and we want to float this material in order to produce some metals coming from it. Okay.
And as you can see, in the end of the process, it's quite nice, the color of the bubbles. It's quite interesting. So this picture is also from Germany. So this video so it's also from Germany. It was also a footage from Anna. And this, this company, Magwin, it's a company, it's a Deutsche company, it's a German company, and they have different machi flotation machines. They have also pneumatic flotation. And this one is the Jameson cell that I showed you guys before, just a picture. And then in here, you can see a Jameson cell working. So let's move forward. And in here, we have some flotation performed here in Brazil, in my lab. And this is for rare earth minerals. And this is another PhD candidate. This is Francioli. And here you can see on your left hand side, one kind of collector, one type of collector. It is called AP Min. And see how the froth is strange and not so much mineralized. It is an F a fatty acid, but you have big bubbles and then he's going to perform flotation of this material, okay? So now I'm going to pause the video because otherwise you're going to stay here for a long time. And I'm going to play a video using Macauba, that same Macauba that I showed you guys before, as collector. Okay. So now let's start the air, and then we have Macauba being the collector used. So as you can see, there is no much difference between the froth, but actually. When you take a look at the chemical results and the recovery, you can see a lot of difference, okay? So yes, Macauba, it is a collector. It is a fatty acid that you can use for floating your material. And in here we have rare earth carbonates, and that's why we're using fatty acids.
thank you for listening to me and to stay with me up to 10.30 in the Tuesday evening. Okay, so thank you very much for being here. I appreciate very much. And you guys that is watching that are watching us on YouTube channel, thank you very much. Okay.